episode of the Roundhouse Roundtable. I am Kevin Dent. I'm here with Derek Garrett, our founder and CEO of Roundhouse Multimedia. Hello, everyone. And we're excited to have our first guest, uh, all the way in from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is a digital shopper experience expert with 20, 22 years of experience and author of shopper marketing articles and a book in the analytics world and the founder of StoreStream Metrics, a firm that designs, activates, measures, and optimizes digital media solution based on data-backed evidence. His name is Adrian Weidman. And Thank you. We, welcome. we welcome you here. Thank you for having all me. All the way it's from exciting. Minneapolis. Yeah, yeah, so, in the studios of Roundhouse. Excellent. Yes. Excellent, excellent. So <laughs> what exactly is a digital shopper experience professional? Give us some wow. insight there. Um, yeah, what, what I've focused in on is looking at, uh, in, in the retail world, as retailers and brands want to uh, uh, further the experience or connect the, the relationship to their shoppers using multimedia, audio, video components, how to introduce those technologies, those experiences at retail, uh, but focused on the a measured way of of determining the efficacy of those technologies. So how exactly does shopper experience and consumer emotion connect with music? Uh, music, uh, for me, I, I started in the music business. That's how I got into this space. Really? Yeah. And um, music to me is, uh, it's, it's an emotion, it's an oral time machine. Uh, it connects uh, when we listen to music, certain certain songs, certain albums, uh, they take us immediately back in a time and a place. Absolutely. And I think uh, in the shopper world, uh, it's we're always trying to connect emotionally to a shopper, and we try it through all sorts of ways: lighting, merchandising, packaging. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, audio is always seen as sort of, we have to have it, but it's not optimized, it's not leveraged nearly to the extent that it should be, because it does trigger emotional responses. And shoppers, when, 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 when they are in that store, um, there, are, there are all these uh, uh, visual speed bumps, I call them. Uh, distractions. Uh, audio should be and can be an amazing vehicle to take that shopper back to a, a time and place in their life. Uh, and, and that's what's exciting about being here with Roundhouse because you all recognize that and what uh, hopefully as we work together we're moving towards how to turn audio into a measured medium. Right, right. It sounds like it kind of speaks to what we do at Roundhouse a little bit in terms of making that emotional connection. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, more on the hospitality side, but that's exactly what we're doing on the hospitality side. We're, we're, the guest is there for seven, the average stay I think is like seven, seven days, six nights, seven days, and they're, you know, we have to entertain them, we have to connect with them. So what we do is we, understand the brand, we understand you know, what, how they want to connect with their audience, what, what, what demographic they want to attract, um, and then it's our job utilizing music architecture to, to achieve that, where, where the guests are actually, when they're in a Japanese restaurant, we want to bring that experience right. to life for them, even though they're at an all-inclusive restaurant. That is a game changer now. I mean, you go to these all-inclusive resorts now, um, they're, you know, they're bringing in, like, for, for the Indian restaurant, they're bringing in a chef from India for the Italian, you know, so they're really, um, are, are focusing on the experience. And so, again, from our perspective, you know, with utilizing music architecture, what we do is we help to, to, to enhance that experience. Um, be it in the lobby, be it in a restaurant, spa, pool area, wherever it may be. Well, and I suspect that those guests being there for seven days, th that experience needs to live with them for a long time. Absolutely. So as you guys uh, look at what those audio tracks are in those environments, when that vacation or that guest goes back to Iowa or back to Minneapolis, six months later they hear a song 
that connects them to that experience. The timestamp, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, that's what we want to achieve, I think, at retail, too. It's becoming these immersive, experiential environments and, and how, to, how to make brick and mortar re retail relevant in an Amazonian world today. Sure. You've got to give them something beyond just merchandise on a shelf. Um, totally agree. So, so paint that picture for us. Paint, paint the picture of a shopper going to the mall and then entering a retail store and some starts, the engagement starts, whether it's, I don't know, digital signage, decor, aroma marketing, music, of course. Yeah. Like, walk us through that experience. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of research out there. Um, and, and I think one of the things that, that we like to look at in store stream metrics when a shopper comes in to an environment, we actually map the store. Um, we look at, you know, all too often people put signs right at the entrance of a store. The shopper has no time to digest that information. There's a transition period. You need 10, 12 feet for, you know, we walk into an environment, there's a pause, we want to take, you know, look around. What's, what's going to attract our attention? What's drawing our attention? Um, so we want to be really sensitive to where the shopper is in their journey. Um, you have to be sensitive to that. So it's really important that we look at uh, the, the traffic paths, uh, how merchandise is positioned, and how you reach out uh, to that shopper. Uh, worked for, I did a big project for Lowe's years ago and the CMO at the time came up with a brilliant expression um, and we were specifically talking about in-store media as it related to digital signage. And he, he coined the expression, what we wanna do is we wanna politely interrupt the shopper journey. Um, I think all too often this technology gets put into play as a visual speed bump. Oh, let's put a big sign here, whether that's, that's a print sign or whether it's a digital sign, let's put it here because we know all our shoppers are gonna be standing here. Shoppers are smart, they get it. And if, they're, uh, if, if it's that visual speed bump, they are going to edit it out. They're gonna see it as a distraction an invasion of their privacy, and we get inundated with all these messages every day, um, we start filtering those experiences. You need to be sensitive to that. As it relates to audio, uh, just what, uh, what Derek was saying, you have to really understand the brand, what it represents, who it represents, the community that that store serves, Absolutely. and be sensitive to uh, to that localization. Right. And, and those audio experiences have to connect with the community that that store serves. Now, I also would say, you know, music needs to be more in the forefront. I feel like it's still being treated as background music. Yeah. And when you're, when you're treating music as background music, I, I think you're missing the mark. Right. It's almost, because at that point, it's almost noise yeah. Yeah. opposed to enhancing the experience. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, that's why you know, it's great for us you know, to be working with you, um, Adrian, because I think you know, some of the stuff that we're working on, we're going to be, really be able to um, achieve that goal of bringing background music to the forefront. I um, think where, the, where this is all going, and, and we've had some meetings this week, and we used this expression we, that resonated with some of these meetings that we had, all content, whether it's audio, whether it's video, whether it's motion graphics, whatever the case is, whether it's in-store, whether it's on our mobile phone, online, uh, all content absolutely needs to be data-driven. And, and I think the, the, the opportunity lies in understanding and learning and listening to those shoppers. They'll share some of that interest, you know? Right. If they're in, the, if they're in, an, uh, in, in a store, um, age-old reality of retail, if I can keep the shopper in the store longer, they're, they're gonna buy more things. No. Sounds like a, 
evolution, so to speak. And speaking of which, now that we are in the depth of, of social media, and I'm interested to hear how you think you know, that affects your ability uh, to target consumers and shoppers and engage with them prior, prior to their um, entry to the customer journey, during the customer journey, thereafter the customer journey. I think there's a lot to be said about the fact that social media these days is really ruling a lot of communication in the marketplace. So how does that help, hinder, or affect? Wow. Uh, that's a, uh, I have to explore that one. Boy, you threw me for a loop there. Um, uh, I, I think one of the things with, with social media and the world we live in today, I think uh, we essentially live in a nanosecond world. Uh, we don't take time, um, you know, we share things. We, you know, there's this instant gratification that's required, right? Um, uh, I age myself here, but, you know, there, there was a, I remember album covers Right, the double album, right, mm -hmm. and and uh, in college those double albums were often used. They had dual purposes, um, but reading all of those fine print, getting in, involved, uh, I think we lose some of that with social media because of that immediacy. Um, the, the challenge is how to break through that uh, the world where everything's being shared. There's an immediacy to it. Uh, you know, when we get our get social feeds, uh, the, the speed at which, how many times have we looked at something, maybe resonated with it, and we actually want to share an hour later? <laughs> that try finding that feed again. It's it, it's Again, lost. It's in. it's right. lost forever because right. it's just so it, it's just yeah. so invasive. Um, shoppers are inundated with these kind of messages. And brand marketers, retailers, they're, they're checking boxes off. Oh, we, we need an app, we need a website, we need a mobile. And they're checking the boxes off. That doesn't mean it's, they're, they're reaching their shopper whatsoever. They're, they're, it's part of the paradigm of they're doing, in the digital world, they're doing what they did 30 years ago in the analog world. They're just turning what they did into ones and zeros. That doesn't work. Yeah. There's, a, there's a white, there's a clean slate out there and it's, we have to change the paradigm. Right. And we have to understand that the shopper is taking control. That's right. It's no longer the brands uh, and those retailers dictating, here's the message that you're gonna see. Uh, those days are over. Right. It's now the shopper saying, these are the messages I'm interested in getting, and if you don't provide them in a way that I want to uh, receive them, they're gonna get edited out. Right. So I'm gonna jump in now, since yeah. Kevin hit you with that, that, that <laughs> doozy, to lighten up. So, yeah. so yesterday while we were, I was really surprised while we were, um, on the train, actually yep. going down to the city, I was really shocked to hear how involved you were musically. You know, yeah. like well, I, I had, the right, I kind of knew a little bit, but yesterday you really went into depth. Um, you know, the fact that you worked for uh, BNK, what does BNK stand for? Rule and Care. Rule and Care with microphones, which I used to yeah. use all the time back in my yeah. producing and engineering days, and he used to work for, for, for that, uh, yeah. for that well, company. It was, it was a, I, I was brought, educated as an engineer, loved music, um, started, taking some courses at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from uh, uh, the professor that, he was, he was like the audio geek. Right. Um, it wasn't a audio course, um, but he, there were some graduate courses and we started uh, learning about test and measurement. And they had some Brule and Care test and measurement equipment uh, in their lab. And at the same time, I was uh, in charge of uh, working at Wisconsin Public Radio, in charge of all their remote recording, and uh, basically answered an ad in a, a little black and white ad That's in the awesome. back of Studio Sound Magazine and, and 
I, Studio I, Sound I, magazine. Right? You Ooh. remember? <laughs> um, and off to Denmark I went. I got the gig. And, um, you know, I've never looked back. It was an amazing time. And this was at a time where um, there, were <clears throat> there were some... Uh, audio engineers it, select and and mostly in the um, classical music or recording area right. uh, on one end I have to say this the Grateful Dead were at the other end they were using Brulin Care test microphones um, for recording purposes and right this was right at the same time where you know we moved from analog tape recording over to uh, uh, digital recording. Right. You know, I came up in the era where we still used a razor blade Absolutely. to edit tape. Same for me. Um, so uh, it's been a long, fun ride. And uh, again, for me, coming back, it's, it's almost like a homecoming for me. Um, went off, did shopper marketing, digital signage, um, and to be able to begin working with Roundhouse and coming back and, and to my roots. Uh, you and I, you know, uh, when we first met I was several say, months ago, tell that story down in <laughs> yeah, I'll let you tell it. It was great. <laughs> but so, Kevin, we, we we had a meeting set up um, down in Orlando. We were down there for uh, Infocom, and that was Kevin and I. That was our first time down at Infocom. So we were going oh, that was to... your first time there? Yeah, that was our first time at Infocom. Very good. Very good. And so we, as you know, but we had this dinner, um, and the the dinner was um, yeah it was yeah it was a dinner the same night that we arrived. Yeah. Anyway, so Kevin and I are rushing to get to the to the restaurant. We get to the restaurant, and as soon as I walk in, this tall guy, tall good looking guy, just comes and basically hugs me. I, and and it was Adrian, and he uh, I guess you reached you, you went online. Yeah, I did. Ooh. Well, well, our our mutual friend Brandon right. had introduced us, had invited me to join you all for dinner, and had given me a little background. And then I you know looked up Roundhouse. I'm going. Oh, wait a minute, what's this? And, it's a little bit. and you knew, yeah, and it was and it was like instant, like we just connected right away. Well, and, and we laughed because uh, while, we, while we met just a few months ago, uh, there's a good chance that you and I had passed each other in the hallways at Clinton Recording in Absolutely. New York and Absolutely. some of these places. And remember last night, we, we also, we think that I probably met Barb, Barb. Uh, and and when she was working with yeah. uh, DMP and with DMP, yeah. Well, and and you had said you'd run into uh, Billy Barber, Billy who, Barber. Lives, who lives yeah. here, who and lives so, here in yeah. so it, it's been a it's been a fun several months here, and and you know based on some of the meetings we've had this week, we're certainly excited to move the move the needle. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. It's going to be exciting, and and I think you would use the expression, and, and certainly what we've encountered, uh, there's some interesting disruption afoot, uh, and I think we're going to we're going to change the perception uh, and the reality of what and how audio and music specifically uh, plays in the role of uh, in-store shopper marketing experiences. So I guess it goes without saying. There's a reason why. You know, we've come together. You've got that background, all this great experience in music. You really, really know music. You guys talked about, you know, sort of back in the day. You talked about the way things were done and the way things were recorded, which is it's just invaluable to have people like you that have that type of experience. And then be now moving forward, I want to ask the question about social media and how you de deal with that. Again, you're bringing all of your experience from the past and apply it to, applying it to the evolution, as we talked about. You talked about moving forward, this disruption and sort of where we're going. So my next question would be, what's next? What do you see on the horizon as it relates to, I don't know, technology or any other factors that you think impact either the guest or the, the consumer, uh, the shopper, um, what what do you foresee that's out there? Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow the audio world a little bit with in my response. Um, we have seen we're coming full circle, um, and look at the the renewed interest and explosive response to people buying vinyl records again. Yeah. You know, I think there's, I think the technology has gotten so invasive that we're not connecting emotionally anymore. Right. So I think the technology um, has, we've, has insulated us 
from those right. emotional responses. Right. Um, so I think the trend is simplification, some back to basics. Right. Um, I think you know people want they want human touch. Um, we've seen it particularly in retail where there's been this drive to introduce technology, yet in, in doing so, we've missed why people enjoy shopping. You know, it's talking to people, you know, having salespeople get involved. How can I help you? You know, Absolutely. going back to some of those basics, I, I think the difference, one of the, di one of the key differences Retailers are scrambling to, to bring relevancy back to their brick and mortar because of Amazon and online shopping. We've heard it in the news every single day. The irony is the one thing the store has that you're not going to get online is human relevancy mm -hmm. and touch. The experience. The experience. That human bond. And I think that's, I think we're going to see more and more those, those stores that, that we talked about all content being data driven mm -hmm. and complementing that data-driven media and content with human touch and relevance. I think that's, that's where this, that's the, the retailers that get that, yeah. I think are gonna th survive and thrive. And that's where we're at, that ties into us musically. You know, we're not using any algorithms or anything like that when we're creating play playlists for our clients. It's, you know, our music architects are handpicking every single song for our playlist. And know? to piggyback on that, again, you guys are the producers and the, you know, the engineers of music, and I come from more of a marketing perspective and sort of the consumer perspective as well. But I feel like, and just sort of the build on what you said, I think it's this uh, interaction, this engagement, this involvement. Uh, I think that's what my opinion, what the next thing is with regard to consumers or fans. I went to the, the Jay-Z Coldplay concert several years ago when, the, when they first opened the Barclays Center here, and they gave you this wristband when you came in, and no one knew what it was, what it was, but everyone wanted one because it said Jay-Z and Coldplay <laughs> on it. And during a, a portion of the concert, to the beat of the music they were playing, the, there was this flashing Light, awesome light. Oh, which was yeah. synchronized with the entire audience. That's awesome. All right, yeah. and it, and it changed colors, and it was to the, and we were part of the concert, right. and there was something to be said about. I kept this. Thing. Matter of fact, I have it here. Yeah. I kept it, and that was this. They were involved. They were they were engaged. They were a part of it, and I think there's something there with regard to to the experiences at, at hospitality with them. I don't know having the ability to choose their songs or yeah. something uh, within the retail environment. Environment. Somehow we know what someone's favorite song is, perhaps, before they come. I don't know what it is, but this engagement, this, this human, this touch, you know, and involved. Well, I think it, m music is absolutely that mechanism that creates that emotional bond. Uh, being involved in retail and technology, uh, the, the vendors of technology, everybody out there talks about engagement. Yeah. Well, it, what does that mean? And in their terms, it, they're looking at engagement with based on what they have to offer. Sure. So in the digital signage space, engagement means, oh, touch screen. I have to touch it. And, yeah. and that, that's only true uh, because that's what, I'm, that, that's what that vendor is trying to sell, yeah. right? I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit, and kind of bring it back to music, and hopefully th this is something oh, that we good. can. <laughs> <laughs> is, Those were tough <laughs> questions. <laughs> this will be this get will be, philosophical on you. Just, this will be something that we can all sort of jump in on. But uh, I will start with our guest. Um, interest, interested to hear if there is one particular song or album that has had an impact on you or your life, um, could have been as a child, could have been your first album that you purchased, could have been in your adulthood that it was during a transition that you just you know, really remember and it brings you back to that place. Like, is there anything that jumps out at you? Yeah, any, any Led Zeppelin album. <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, the, the album that, that is always in my when I get the question around uh, artist or, or or tracks. Um, the one album that is always always in my top two or three is Little Feet's Waiting for Columbus. Um, and we were talking about some of these stories um, when I started 
uh, I started listening off of uh, through a, a, this bizarre late night FM radio station in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. And I remember building a Heath kit AM FM radio and you hanging. Built it? Yeah, I built it. Wow. I will say this. My dad built it and he let me watch him build it. Oh, He's okay. one of those kind of guys, okay. right? Okay. Get away from here. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I remember having to hang a wire out my bedroom window to get this radio station and, you know, these, you know, this, this, you know, I remember 10 years after and Led Zeppelin and just, you know, as a young child, it just blew me away. And God didn't give me the gift in, in the fingers, um, but music became a really important piece of my life. And as I mo moved through some of the, uh, through my life, you mentioned, uh, got an opportunity to work at Brule and Care, which I, I learned firsthand the power of brand. Uh, Brule and Care was the gold standard in test and measurement in the world. And w you know, going back to the Little Feet record, looking at Little Feet records, early Earth, Wind and Fire records, mm -hmm. there was something about those records that just spoke to me. And the one common denominator in those records, uh, as, you, as we talked about earlier about looking at the album covers, was the producer engineer, it was George Massenburg. And he sort of became my, like, this, this idol, I guess you'd say, um, my celebrity crush, right? And through Brule and Care, years later, uh, I actually got to meet George, and we became friends. Um, so it's, it was a fun story, and, and we talked a bit earlier. You know, it, it speaks, to, uh, speaks to my timeline, I guess. But I think in, in music, I actually think in terms of albums. You know, and and I know we've had conversations where tracks. You know, right. in today's world, it's tracks. Nobody buys albums anymore. Um, and and you know, I'm from a generation where you know I I relate to um, to to full albums. Um, now you mentioned something earlier. I would like to go back to you know this whole idea of streaming and algorithms. And what's been fun with this new technology for me, it's. Those algorithms, whether it's Spotify or Pandora, they are exposing, they, they expose you to music that you may have never, to music and artists that, that you may have never heard of. Um, I know for me, uh, sort of my guilty pr pleasures is, is, you know, Dropkick Murphys. Uh, I would have never learned about the Dropkick Murphys unless it came through these streaming services. Right. Um, I happen to be, a, I, I love ska music. Um, and my son and I have been renovating his house and we put on music and, you know, I, I, I drew, I, I get to pick the music, at least when I'm there. And so I put on my selection and, and we've been, you know, ska music is part of that experience. Um, so he, uh, several weeks ago, uh, it was my birthday, and he surprised me he had bought two tickets to go see Real Big Fish from Southern California ska band that's been around 30 some years. They were playing in a club in Minneapolis called the Caboose. And I think I might have been the, old, the oldest guy there. <laughs> but he took me, we had a, the best time. And, awesome. you know, so it, again, how music connects and weaves together, um, you know, that. Real big fish, ska music, my son relates to having experience that I'll just never forget. So, and I think that's, that's going back to your earlier questions, you know, we're missing that. We're, we're, we're missing that, the power of what music is and how it relates to time and space and emotions. I feel like it's taken for, like people take music for granted. They do. Almost, it's yeah. in a weird way. It's, it, we, we, it's how the business we, has we, changed. Right, we need it, we listen to it, but you know, people are always listening to music, but I just feel like it's such, it's probably the most taken for granted medium that's out there. What right. about you? What, what, what song or album or well, period? Or? Un, uh, unlike Adrian, in my time, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for me it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily a specific um, album, necessarily. It's more of just like, 
different artists, different songs, but you know, growing up, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire for sure, Michael McDonald. Um, you know, and then I went into, and then I had this one, you know, of course I did the hip hop, uh, definitely, you know, with Run DMC, and when they first came out, um, LL Cool J, that was, that was definitely a big part of, of um, my childhood, um, you know, growing up, what I was listening to. Um, but then my older brothers, they were into like that parliament, um, oh, right. George Clinton. So, I, so for me, it was like a mixture of like, um, you know the, the hip hop scene, then the the the, the, the funk. funk, the funk scene, and then for my mom and dad, it was you know a little Motown, but that's also the the Michael McDonald, mm. the Earth Wind and Fire that came from mom and dad for the yeah. for the most part. Now when I listen to music, music for me is seasonal in terms of what I'm listening to. So right now we're in summer. I'm you know. I'll, when I'm alone, not with the kids. When I'm with the kids, that's a different listening experience. But when I'm, you know, just alone and I get to choose what we're listening to, I'm kind of in that yacht rock mode. That's yeah, that's. We, we talked about we, this. Where yeah. that? Where I just I just heard this from a business colleague about you know literally a year ago. Right. I never heard the expression before. And now it's the thing, you know, yacht rock. But and so that's like my summer mode, and. Once the the leaves start to turn, and it's not like I like decide one day, okay, I'm not going to listen to yacht rock. It's now time to listen to classical, but I really enjoy classical mm -hmm. in, in in like the fall. Um, you know, winter you go into the holidays, you know, music, and I'm kind of bouncing all over the place. But I would say the distinct two seasons where I, I know every year I kind of gravitate to the same you know style that I'm that I'm following would be summer yacht rock and the fall classical. Yeah. And then, yeah. So, so interesting point. You know, we talked. You have a seasonal approach to what you listen to. Why you're not alone, right? Everybody's got their the way they dice and slice what they're listening to and and why they're listening to it. Right. Why are we not bringing those those realities to m music uh, in the in store experience? It speaks to the 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 personalization. On everybody has a different trigger point what music I mean we all have you know if I'm driving in the car by myself you know uh, I like to air guitar not air guitar probably air drum on the yeah, on the right. steering wheel but you know the volume goes up and it's a completely different collection of music than if somebody else is in the car right, right. so uh, again it's it's so personal yet here we have major brands that they check the box. We're going to put a music. We'll put music in the store. Background music. They, they, there is no correlation to th their reality and our individual reality. Right. And and it just seems like a lost opportunity to. And, and today's technology, it should be. It's it's frankly it's easy to deliver that. Right. Uh, it's just getting people the consciousness, getting brand and marketing. Uh, folks to think innovatively and take it out of the take music out of just here's the checkbox let's move it out of checkbox take it take it back take a second look at it and how do we make this a a measured medium that we know connects emotionally with each and every one of our shops. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head with the, the use of the word emotional. You know, when I think and you guys have a lot of interesting some overlapping uh, influences as you think back on you know what sort of uh, carve your interest with regard to music for me you talked about specific art albums you talked about you know a lot of different things some of which with Motown which you heard your parents playing for me believe it or not it goes back to a radio station mm. because my grandmother just happened to be the one that was toting us around after school to extracurricular activities, both sports and in music and dance classes and everything. But she only had an AM radio, so it stayed on uh, WABC. And so every now and then, a song from like Elton John or Fleetwood Mac um, mm -hmm. Or Sly and the Family Stone and some Stevie one would co come on from the 70s. And sometimes people are surprised that I know every word because you know how radio stations are. They play <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. All yeah. Of, and, I heard, and I heard these songs every day. So for me personally, and that was, that was one of those, you know, times in my life where I was an adolescent maturing and, you know, just going through that, those whole growth, uh, growing pains. But being with my grandma, because she was just my, my rock, was just always a... Uh, 
just a, she was just always a supporter. And that ta it takes me back to that feeling of being with grandma. Again, any of the music that was played on those radio stations. So it's interesting for, for you guys, you know, you've got some albums, you've got several influences. For me, it was actually a radio station, yeah. you know? And, but you're right, and in the, in the end, the common thread that we all can, can connect to is that emotion. emotion. Yeah. It's, it, right. it's a great story because it's, it, it, it's, it's an oral time machine. You know, you hear those, you know, it takes you back. The first you think about, it's not the artist. You're not thinking about the artist experience. When you hear that song, you start, the, your immediate thought is sitting in that car with your Absolutely. grandmother. Yeah. You know, right. and, and y nobody else can experience that. It's, it's, right. a, it's, a, it's a singular event, and we all have it. And imagine if you could, you know, amplify that with, with the in-store experience. Because right. now you have, you know, 100, 200, 300 shoppers in the store. What if you could touch each one of them in a the meaningful end. way? Yeah. There you go. It's an exciting, exciting opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. We've got just a few minutes to go. Um, my last question, Derek actually sort of touched on already. So I'm going to throw it, at it out at you. If there's enough time, maybe I will jump in as well. But um, <clears throat> sort of considering this seasonal interest, the seasonal approach. Um, we were interested to know, just off the top of your head, you know, what do you like to listen to in our current season? We're in August, we're near the end of the summer, still some pools, poolside and beachside time uh, that's out there. Like, what, what would you pull up? Let's just let's hear. I, um, in my office, uh, I, have, I have a radio, radio station on, and that radio station is 89.3, The Current, and it happens to be the Minnesota Public Radio, one of the Minnesota Public Radio stations. And I think they've been, they bought a license, an open air license. And it is, it, it's sort of the, the new independent music. I don't even know the genre, but it's, um, you know, I get exposed to J.D. McPherson and, and, you know, Brandy Carlisle and artists. And, and that's on all the time simply because I want to learn what's new. You know, there's right. always, I don't care the genre, I love music, period. If it's done well, I love it. From classical to hip hop, it doesn't matter. As long as it's done well, um, and that's a subjective word, right? Um, so that's, what, that's what's on in okay. my office in the I, back. I have one quick question. So in your opinion, Adrian, what? what <laughs> is the best recorded album of all time. Wow. Or, yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, or artist, that's, the, yeah. it could be like. Well, it, it, interesting because it takes me back to Little Feet. And, and it takes me back to. Over Steely Dan? Uh, Steely Dan, close second. Uh, really, so wait yeah, a minute. For me, for me, yeah, it, no, was, it wow. was, it was, it was, it's still, um, again, it, there's an emotional bond there too. Right. right. Um, I have to revisit that. Um, it's it, it's in my opinion, it's, it's certainly one of the, the the best live, and and I happen to love live recordings. Okay. I, 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 well, that's I, total opposite for Steely Dan. I'm correct. Sure. So so yeah, they would the, work the, for a month on yeah, just drums. The overproduction, yeah. uh, you know, it's um, and I I think it's part of my it's part of my my experience and what I did at Wisconsin Public Radio because it was. It was live to two track, live to tape, live broadcast mixes. Um, th those are hard. It's it's hard to capture that nuance live. Right. Um, and and it, there's a direct influence on on the quality, if I can use that word, um, of the the audio translates to the quality of the musicianship as much as anything else. Okay. So, Guys, so, we've, we've got about 30 seconds. About 30 seconds. I just wanted to get a quick plug in. This has been fantastic. The first episode of Roundhouse Roundtable. Thank you to our guests. Thank you, Derek. This has been a fantastic discussion. Awesome, Adrian. We want to make sure we just ask our audience to rate and share and tell everyone about and tune in on your, fa your favorite podcast platform. And we look to see you next time.